So far this year, Baker Mayfield, the Cleveland Browns quarterback, uh, has thrown six touchdowns, 12 interceptions. He has 1,690 yards passing, a 57% completion percentage. And it, the, the touchdown and interception ratio is really surprising. Six touchdowns, 12 interceptions. What's going on? He just flipped out on, on a reporter. He, he, he got really mad. He stormed out of a press conference. Oh, and by the way, I'm sure you know his team is 2-5. and five. They've not been overly successful this year. So what is going on? What does the film say about Baker Mayfield? Now, to start off, you need to have a base of understanding with what the Cleveland Browns are trying to do on offense. Their offense runs through their running back, Nick Chubb. Their goal is to consistently run the ball well, then fake the run and throw the ball downfield. A fake run, by the way, is called a play-action pass. I'm going to refer to play-action pass a lot. A fake run is a play-action pass. Now, many fans have been critical of the play calling, saying that the Browns keep throwing deep instead of running shorter stuff. Those people are right. The Browns repeatedly run play action and make it so all of Baker's options are farther downfield. That requires him to hold on to the ball for longer. I don't love the Browns' offensive philosophy. It's not what I would run, but in theory, it can work. The Browns have had some success at times and do find good matchups. When everything is going right, when the running game is working well and Baker has time to throw, then the Browns can move the ball really, really effectively. But here's the fatal flaw of their offense. If your offensive line is bad, you're screwed. And I understand every single team needs a good offensive line. But the Browns make it even harder on themselves because of how long they expect Baker to hold on to the ball in the pocket. A great example is week one against the Titans. The Browns are backed up on their own one yard line and they call a longer developing play. Even though the Browns have been struggling with pass protection all game long, they made this call. This is what they were confident running on the one yard line. The Titans got pressure immediately with just a four man rush. The right tackle was badly beaten and all of the Browns receivers had longer developing routes. That means that when Baker was ready and needed to release the ball, none of his receivers were ready and looking for a pass. There was no chance this play would work. When you watch the Browns, almost every single route concept is vertical. That makes the Browns' offensive line an even bigger concern. Baker doesn't have time for longer developing plays. What needs to happen is an offensive coaching adjustment needs to be made. The truth is the Browns head coach and offensive play caller Freddie Kitchens isn't doing a good enough job putting his team in a position to succeed. A great example of this is on second and five against the Ravens. The Browns call a play action pass where only two receivers run routes and they run a max protection. What that means is that everyone basically stays inside the block except for the two receivers that run 10 yard hitch routes for the Browns. They run 10 yards, they stop, and they turn around looking for the ball. This is the weirdest play call ever because the Ravens are running cover one, press man coverage. Those receivers have guys following them wherever they go. This is a bad play call because the last thing you want to do against man coverage is stop. Against man coverage, you want to run away, use movement routes and run away from the man guarding you. Okay, I'm going to stop everything right now. I know I'm getting into what's going on, the film, the coach, what's, what's happening with the Browns. But I want to be very clear. The Browns are 2-5 and five right now. They have nine games left on their schedule. These are the teams they play. They play the Broncos, the Bills, the Dolphins, the Steelers twice, the Bengals twice. They play the Cardinals and then the Ravens. I believe they're going to win six or seven of those next nine games. They're going to be playing bad teams, a lot of backup quarterbacks. And if they have a lot of success the rest of this year, please do not miss the point. If they win six of their next nine games and have an okay record at the end of the year, it doesn't change the fact that what we've seen on film to begin the year has been really, really bad. The things on film, the habits we've noticed and observed are not good. Don't let that distract you from what the film says. Now, if you've watched Baker at all this season, the Browns' offensive line is bad. They miss assignments. They miss blocks. Baker's constantly got pressure in his face. There's this one egregious, horrible pass protection design I want to talk about. It put the Browns' tight end at number 88, Demetrius Harris, who's not an offensive lineman, by the way. 
put him one-on-one, blocking the former number two overall pick defensive end Nick Bosa. It was an awful mismatch. That played a part in why Baker threw an interception on this play. Now, granted, it's a great catch by the 49ers corner and great interception by Richard Sherman. And it was a bad, inaccurate pass, but it was partly caused because of poor pass protection. If you watch Baker this year, you will notice he looks a lot less accurate this year than he has in the past. And you're not wrong. He is less accurate this year than he's been before. Baker has done a poor job this season managing pressure in the pocket. You know, going from college to the NFL is really, really hard. You need to be able to identify coverages, set protections, make good decisions, and be accurate while throwing into tiny windows. And then you have to do all of that. And this is why the NFL is the most difficult league in the world to play in. You need to be able to do all of that while people are hitting you and while there's pressure in your face. Right now, Baker's not doing a good enough job handling pressure in the pocket. At times, Baker has looked panicky this year. His footwork is bad. He doesn't set his feet. He doesn't have a good base. And that bad footwork is causing his accuracy to decline. Baker likes to run around. However, his ability to scramble and extend plays has provided mixed results. There's no clear right or wrong here. Sometimes this scrambling leads to good plays, and sometimes not so good plays. When things go bad, it's usually because he's holding on to the ball too long. He tries to make every play work and doesn't throw the ball away enough to live to see another down. Okay, Uh, we also need to address the checkdowns. Here's how the Browns' checkdown system works. When the ball is snapped on a pass play, the running back is in charge of helping the offensive line block. If there's work for him to do, the running back will provide support for the offensive line. If there's no one for him to block... Then he'll check down, giving Baker an outlet to throw to underneath. The problem is, the Browns' offensive line is so bad that they always need help, meaning Baker regularly doesn't have a check down. Running backs get caught up blocking and aren't an option for Baker to throw to underneath. You know, coaches like the Rams head coach Sean McVay combats this by having shallow outlets underneath built into every single play call. So you can blame the offensive line, you can blame the play design, but the truth is Baker Mayfield isn't perfect either. One of the issues he had at the beginning of the season was that he regularly bailed out of the pocket early. However, there has been some progression in this one area. In his more recent games, he's been stepping up to throw the ball downfield more frequently. The 49ers defense actually ran a play with a delayed sixth blitzer. It's a good play design. They'd bring a five-man rush that would flush Baker outside to escape the pocket. Then they'd bring that sixth guy as a cleanup crew to take care of Baker once he left the pocket. It worked really effectively. Baker has also missed reads quite frequently. He's had a hard time recognizing coverage in the flats. The flats are the area short to the outside of the field. So when a guy is wide open in the flats, it's easy. He'll throw the ball there no problem. But multiple times he's had guys open by one step in a tighter window in the flat, looked at it, and not pull the trigger. Oh, man. Now it's time to talk about Baker's interceptions so far this season. He has 12 of them. We talked about one earlier, but there are still 11 left to cover. A common belief among fans is that a majority of Baker's interceptions were not his fault. That's simply not true. There are three of Baker's interceptions, however, where I give him no fault. One was a great play by a defensive end stealing an attempted fly sweep. Hey, credit the defense. That's a great play. Another simply bounced off one of his receiver's hands. That is not Baker's fault at all. And another one was on a fourth and four at the end of the Rams game. It's hard to blame a quarterback for trying to make a play and keep his team alive at the end. But the rest were all his fault. I understand three of them. Hey, Blame someone else. But Baker needs to take some blame for the other nine interceptions he's thrown this year. Week one against the Titans, he had three interceptions. The first one was on a bad, inaccurate late throw behind Odell Beckham Jr. Number two was on a late throw to the flat. It's a bad throw. It's too far inside. 
and Jarvis Landry wasn't open anyway. And number three, he threw a bad throw high and behind Jarvis Landry, and that one was returned for a touchdown. A pick six, that's Baker's fault. Against the Jets, he threw a pass behind OBJ. OBJ tries to catch it. It's tipped up in the air and intercepted. This is a 50-50 one. It's partly on OBJ. That's a tough catch, but you expect an elite receiver to make that play. However, it's partly on Baker. That's an inaccurate throw behind your receiver. Now against the Ravens, he forced the throw into coverage. It's an RPO, and he has two things to read here. One is the backside inside linebacker, and two is the leverage of the corner. Both reads tell him he needs to hand the ball off, and yet he throws it anyway. You know, first his primary read, the backside inside linebacker, drops into coverage. That's an automatic give. Give the ball to the running back. Let him do his thing. But second, the corner's inside leverage, ready to take away a slant on the inside. Baker should hand this ball off and live to see another day, and instead he throws an interception because he makes a poor decision. How about against the Seahawks? He had three interceptions in that game. On the first one, the Browns ran a rub concept where basically one receiver sets a screen for the other. So on a rub concept, two receivers pass each other. One goes underneath the other. The guy on top tries to get big and slow and kind of get in the way of the defenders, while the other guy goes underneath trying to get open. For whatever reason, Baker throws to the wrong guy here. The Browns are trying to get the ball and set a pick for the guy running outside, and Baker threw inside to the guy who wasn't trying to get open and was setting a pick so a guy could slip underneath and get open in the flat. Now on his second interception of the day, he threw behind Jarvis Landry and allowed a defender to make a play. Another interception, that's on Baker. However, I will admit his third interception against the Seattle Seahawks is 50-50. It bounced off his receiver's hands. It's kind of a judgment call up to you. I think if it touches the receiver's hands, the guy should catch it. But it also was an inaccurate throw behind his receiver. So this one is partly on Baker and partly on the receiver. I mean, so you look at the film and you go, okay, nine of his 12 interceptions Baker played a part in. You can't just blame it all on everybody else. Baker needs to own his mistakes on these plays. I have two final notes. Number one is that part of the reason why the Browns got blown out by the Titans week one was because of penalties. The Browns had 18 penalties and gave up 182 yards in that game. That means the Browns offense faced third and 13 twice. They also saw a third and 18, third and 28, third and 16, third and 10, and a third and 26. That is a really hard group of scenarios to succeed in. Now, the second note is about Odell Beckham Jr. He's been disappointing this year, and there's really no other way to describe it. He's known as an elite receiver. And let me tell you, the guy has a couple incredible plays this season. We know that the best from OBJ is incredible. 89-yard touchdown catches. The problem is we rarely see him at his best. We just don't see it very often. He has dropped a lot of passes, and I mean a lot of passes. Throws that hit him in the hands. I can't overstate it. Drop after drop after drop. Even perfect throws from Baker and still nothing. For whatever reason, him and Baker have not been able to get on the same page this year consistently. It's sad. And it's kind of frustrating to watch as a guy who's not a Browns fan, but I wanted this to be interesting. I wanted Baker and OBJ to be some kind of fiery matchup that would be fun to watch. So those are all the reasons Baker Mayfield and the Cleveland Browns have struggled on offense this year. Poor play design, a bad offensive line, bad footwork, which leads to inaccurate throws, bad decisions and missed reads, and a supposedly elite receiver that only shows up part of the time. That is what the film says about Baker Mayfield. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is my podcast, Strong Opinion Sports. It's my favorite thing in the entire world. And I want to be very clear and open with the audience. Um, my YouTube channel is monetized. What that means is that some of my videos make ad revenue. It's fewer than you think. A lot of them get claimed. But in the past, I've received donations from people on Patreon and PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash Zach Schaumler. Patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. And because I'm making ad revenue, it felt kind of weird just 
receiving donations. I wanted to give something back for the donations. And so people who support me on Patreon can give me a dollar a month and that allows them access to a pool where they can ask questions. If you send me questions through Patreon, Patreon's DM service, you comment on one of my posts on Patreon. Uh, if you give a dollar a month, you can submit questions. And with my eyeballs, I look at every single question submitted. Then at the end of my podcast, I pick the best top couple questions and read them on the show and answer them in a segment I call Ask Zach. Now that's for people who have money and want to support me that way. If you have no money to give, no problem. I totally understand. I grew up in a mobile home. I've been a broke college because I totally get it. Um, but if you want to help in some capacity at the end, you can support the show by telling your friends about it. Share it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is. Help me grow by telling your friends about this show. It would mean a lot to me. Uh, if you believe in my dream and you believe in this show, tell your friends about Strong Opinion Sports. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much, and I uh, hope you have a great day.